Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. I'm ABC's youth pastor, Josh Comer, and I'd like to welcome you to worship at Acton Baptist this morning. If you're visiting with us today, we are so glad that you're here. And we'd ask that you would fill out our connection card that's located in the pew in front of you. And following service, go ahead and bring it by the connection desk. Meet one of our staff members, or simply just drop it in one of our offering boxes outside the doors of the worship center. Today, following services in the community commons, come hear about our upcoming trip to New Mexico to serve the Navajo people. If you're interested in going on our mission trip this summer, we'd invite you to join us. Also going on today is our youth's last day of their envelope fundraiser for camp. Simply grab an envelope with the amount that you'd like to donate and place it in the offering box. For more information, see the flyer in your Sunday school class today. Beginning this Wednesday, May 1st, Grief Share will be starting a new session at 10 a.m. For those who have lost loved ones, Grief Share is a great place of healing and of hope. We'd invite you to join us. Thursday, May 2nd, is the National Day of Prayer. See your bulletin for more details. This Saturday, May 4th at 8 a.m., we'll be having a church work day. If you got a bit of elbow grease to offer, we'd love to have you join us as we work on a few projects around the facility. Mother's Day is coming on May 12th, and with it comes our time of family dedication. If you have a child that you'd like to have included in our dedication service, contact our children's pastor, Scott Udaley. On May 19th, we'll be recognizing our class of 2024 high school graduates. If you have a senior you would like us to recognize, sign them up by following the link in your bulletin or by contacting our youth pastor, yours truly. Finally, church, we just wanna say thank you. Thank you for your generosity and giving. Because of your giving, we have been able to accomplish so much in sending the name of Jesus not only throughout our community, but throughout our world. Thank you for your faithfulness to the mission God has given us here in Granbury. You can give online at actonbaptist.com slash give. You can also give in person using our offering boxes located outside the worship center, or you can give by texting ABGIVE to 73256. Those are just a few of our upcoming highlights. For these announcements and more, Check out today's bulletin or head over to actonbaptist.com. Now, we'd like to invite you to join us this morning in worship. Good morning, everyone. I apologize that you have to see my face now twice. Uh, got me on the screen, now you got me here. Uh, Paul is out uh, this morning. So, I get to join you in service this morning. Uh, in case you didn't see, I'm, I'm Josh, I'm the youth pastor here. Uh, I am just delighted to be able to be here with you this morning. So I'd ask that you stand with us as we worship and we hail the power of Jesus' name.
So I've said it once and I'll say it a million times, I learned how to play guitar so I knew what to do with my hands when I sang. Uh, those of you who play guitar and sing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, like I said, I am blessed to be here with you this morning. I'm blessed to be able to call Acton Baptist my church family. Um, I know pastor is going to be preaching on church family today, and my goodness, how ridiculously blessed are we. So as, as we are understanding how blessed we are, uh, we're just going to sing this, this worship song, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now that song is deeply personal 
to me, and uh, even if it's not deeply personal to you, I pray that the message is the words of Job who had lost just nearly everything but his life. And he cries out to the Lord, the Lord gives and the Lord takes, but blessed be the name of the Lord. When you walk with his faithfulness and you walk through the dark times and Job never received an answer to his question of why did he lose everything? And there's many times in our life where we never receive the answer of why, but we know that God is good, that God is passionate for us. That he makes choices that are good for us, even though they may be painful. And so when we ask why cancer, why death, why did I lose my job? In the midst of asking why, and we ask God these honest questions, we, we cling to blessed be the name of the Lord. And it will, Christ will carry us through. I want to read to you this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it kind of wraps up uh, the message of our journal that we've been keeping together as a church. And if you've not been keeping that, it's not too late. I encourage you to step in and keep it here at the end. You'll be blessed for doing so. Uh, but as we move forward in that, you're going to hear, if you've been keeping that journal, you're going to hear so much of what we've been encouraging you over the last few weeks. Deuteronomy 6, chapter, four, chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. You know, Jesus, because you are so good, because in the midst of the forgiveness of my sin, because you continually prove yourself faithful even through the pains of this world. We choose to love you without our heart, soul, and might. We can't help but cry out, blessed be the name of the Lord because the Lord is good and you are faithful to us. You've granted us the gift of your Holy Spirit speaking and whispering to us so that we might actually be able to sit in the presence of the living God and be able to hear your voice and be in this personal relationship with you where we can hear you speak and we are confirmed that you hear us when we speak. You continually work patiently within us to make us into this new man, this new woman that you've designed us to be, that you've called us and created us to be from the beginning of the world. Even when we fail, you're patiently waiting to pick up the pieces, to dust us off like a loving father and set us back on our feet so that we can chase hard after you all the more. So we're here to worship you this morning, to praise you and speak powerfully to us in a way that we will be able to respond. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our King, we pray. Sing with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone have been set free my God my Savior has ransomed shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to Apologize. Guitar players have to take capos off to be in the right key. That's on me. I am so sorry. Oh man, that wasn't Troy's fault. It wasn't Joy's fault at all. They hit the right notes. I hit the terrible note. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so, with that, aren't we glad that we serve a perfect God? Because I'm not at all, and I'm so thankful that I get to praise one who is. Um, this last song we're gonna sing is uh, God Wonders. My goodness, just, just step back. Step back and just think of this. Out of everything that God has created, we look at the sky, look at the night stars, see everything that God has perfectly put on this, in this universe. And he cared enough about you. Cared enough about you to send his son. That's reason to praise. So now that I'm in the right key, let's praise a little bit more.
So, Paul has, uh, Paul has brought something that I have absolutely loved because it brings me back to my, my teenage years. Troy, would you mind playing a little bit? Let these lovely folks greet each other this morning. So, look to your neighbor, say good morning, shake their hand, shake somebody's hand you haven't seen. The, uh, I have the pleasure of being able to sing and play in our second service. Um, there's a song that Paul asked that we would bring to first service today. Um, so uh, I, I will say for me it's a lot easier to sing because I don't have much of a low register. Uh, sometimes I get a little gravelly. But um, before, before Pastor comes up and delivers the message today, um, this is just a song of just praise. Um, if you know it, Please sing it with us. If you don't, please use this time as a prayer. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide, oh, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, cause all Oh, don't 
you can't shout me Lift up your songs You got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on, my soul Oh, don't you can't shout me Lift up your songs Amen. Thank you, Josh. Well, good morning, y'all. You might ought to turn me down just a hair because I'm probably going to get going here in a second. I want to encourage you to continue uh, to go through your journal. Uh, I think you've noticed by now it's really simple. Um, if you've been doing it, very simple. It has everything to do with um, not teaching you so much, right? I mean, it's got one verse and a, and a little statement, but really it's there to get us focused on speaking to and hearing from the Lord God. And of course, we're asking that question, what does God want me to do? Uh, by the way, if you don't have a journal, I'm sure we have some. Uh, make sure you get one before you leave today. We've got some in the table on the on the table in the back. But as you ask that question, what does God want me to do? And again, we're talking about the Christian life. And as we embrace Christ every day, he's always available for the believer. He is in us and moving. And all we need to do is join in with him. So every day we pursue him. That's what the Christian life is. And as we talk with him, we ask, what do you want me to do to know you better? What do you want me to do to change my life? What do you want me to do for my family? It's so what we talked about last week, and this week we add in, what do you want me to do for my church family? To that end, we turn to Acts chapter 2. And I tell you, in this passage, this is as organic as the church gets there at this point. This is right after um, Peter preaches his first sermon and there are 3,000 added to their number that day. And so this is the very first church. There are no habits. Everything is new. There are no denominations, no history of mistakes, no bad habits, just raw. What happens when God moves in a people? So to ask God what he wants me to do for my church family, it isn't a me thing. It is very much a we thing. It is his people. So what does God want us to do for our church family? Let's take a look. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, if you would. Let's all stand in honor of reading God's word this morning. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If you would, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity we have to know you. And Lord, it is in knowing you that we get our strength. It's the words that you speak. It's the touch that you have on our lives and on our souls. So Lord, I pray today that as we open your word that you would speak, that you would touch our hearts, touch our souls, touch our lives. Lord, speak now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. The structure of this passage absolutely matters. And if you were to look at this in its original Greek, what you would discover is that verse 42 is one sentence. Verse 43 is one sentence. And then verse 44 all the way to the end is one sentence. So really in this passage, you have those three sentences. And if, if I could describe each one of those sentences with one word each, it would be inflow, overflow, and outflow. And one leads to the other. It is because of the inflow that there is an overflow that results in an outflow all in the context, not of individuals, but as a church, as a collective group. So while this inflow and overflow and outflow may happen in the individuals, it is necessarily a together experience. In other words, this passage isn't about a bunch of individuals, this passage is about the church. And when I say the church, the church isn't a mere group of individuals. The church is meant to be a synergy of the movement of God. And what is synergy? Synergy is a combined effect that is greater than the sum of their separate effects. In other words, it, with synergy, one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals five. And that is what the church is for. It's for that kind of growth. And this passage shows what it looks like when the synergy of the Holy Spirit takes hold in a church. It shows what one, how one plus one equals five within the church. Now it begins with a combined inflow of devotion. Let's go ahead and hit that next one. It begins with a combined inflow of devotion. In verse 42, it says this, they devoted themselves really to four things, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now those four things they devoted themselves to, those things are all pipelines of inflow. The pipe itself isn't the point it's what is delivered in that pipeline that that's what the point is. There are four pipelines to the presence and the will of God, if you will. They devoted themselves to walking in and receiving the presence and will of God through first the apostles' teaching. Now let's make this clear. And by the way, if you want to take out the uh, if you want to take out the floor monitors, I feel like I'm right on the verge of feedback, and it's going to happen here in just a minute. I can just feel it. So, uh, they have four pipelines, and that first pipeline is the apostles' teaching. And I want to make this clear. Are you ready? I'm not an apostle. I thought I might get an amen on that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not an apostle. 
But praise the Lord, we have the apostles' teaching written down for us, right? This is the apostles' teaching. It's the word of God. And so they devoted themselves to the word of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And it's through the apostles' teaching that they heard from God and grew in knowing him. The second pipeline they used, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. The Greek word koinonia, and that's a, that, that's a oneness. It's a oneness that we have with Christ, and it is a oneness that we have with, uh, uh, within our fellowship, within the church in Christ as well. So this is both the fellowship of knowing Christ and knowing each other in Christ. That was a pipeline. Do you, I, I mean, that, there's growth that happens amongst us and because of us. So that's the second pipeline. The third pipeline, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, and that's the Lord's Supper. In other words, it would be strange for them to use the phrase, the breaking of bread, and it not have to do with the Lord's Supper. And so that's what they were doing. And, and what is the Lord's Supper? It is the application of a spiritual truth in a physical action. Now that begins with the cross, but it spills out into everything that we do as believers. That's a pipeline. The fourth, uh, uh, the, that pipeline is uh, uh, living out the truth of who God is. Then the fourth pipeline, they devoted themselves to prayer. And prayer is that communication with God in our souls. So these four things mean nothing. And, and I just want to make the point. These four things mean nothing without God. They are pipelines to the presence and will of God in our lives. So if I ask the question, what is the Christian life? The answer isn't reading your Bible, going to church, doing the Lord's Supper and praying. No, the Christian life is knowing God personally and doing his will. These four pipelines are God's blessed ways of knowing him. So what did this church do? They devoted themselves to knowing Christ. Now let's look at it from that standpoint. They devoted themselves to these pipelines, if you will. And I tell you, that is more the issue here. The word translated as devoted is the Greek word proskartario. And it means more than our word devoted actually means. This word proskaterio is an intense effort. It is an obstinate per persistence. This church was intensely pursuing the presence of God. It was an obstinance. They were not going to stop. It was an obstinate persistence. They poured their heart and lives into knowing Christ. Suffice it to say, they were highly motivated to know Christ. Which begs the question, what was it that made them so highly motivated? And let me tell you what I'm getting at here. As a church, we are to be highly motivated to pursue the Lord God. But the question is, what motivates us? What is it that motivates our hearts? And I tell you, it's the answer to that question that is the greatest problem, I believe, in the church today. I mean, what is it that compels us to be passionate? What is it that would cause us to give an intense effort and be obstinately persistent? What's our motivation, in other words? Well, you would be happy to hear me say, I Googled it to find out. And I asked the question, what motivates us? And in all of our collective thinking, the machine tells me that the only thing that motivates me is the opportunity to receive what I need and what I want. The opportunity to reach my goals. In other words, the only thing that motivates us is to satisfy our own hunger. What I want, what I need. 
Now, for the non-Christian, that is absolutely true. In fact, it is why we search for God to begin with. We search for God whenever we're lost. We search for God to satisfy the hunger of our souls, right? But here's the question. Once you find Jesus, your hunger is satisfied, isn't it? Now, I would throw in, Jesus said this. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. In other words, Jesus said, he who comes to me will be satisfied. And so here's my question. Is that true now or is that true later? I mean, do we come to church as believers? Do we come to church because we're still in need and still hungry? I tell you, there's a problem there. And let me explain. I want to ask you, why was it that Jesus came to begin with? What was his motivation? And yeah, I'm just trying to get us to think. But I can tell you this, Jesus didn't need anything. He wasn't hungry for anything. Why was it that Jesus came? Well, John 3, 16 answers the question. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. That's why Jesus came. He came because he loves us. Now we've got a, another option. Google didn't have this option. We have another option as to why we would be devoted to God. Are we devoted to him because we are hungry? Or are we devoted to him because we love him? There's the question. And now that starts to open up a whole nother bag of worms, doesn't it? That starts to open up some stuff. And I would say to you, just as Jesus' uh, reason, Jesus' motivation for, being, uh, for coming was his love for us, when that love gets poured into you, it ought to satisfy you. And I'm not talking about later. I'm talking about today. It's to fill you to overflowing. Now, I got to tell you, that's what Paul had come to, to the degree that this incredible thing happens. He had come to this point, and here's what he proclaimed. He said it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Oh my goodness, what did he just say? He's saying the reason he does what he does isn't so, isn't for himself. He's no longer living for himself. The reason he does what he does is because Christ's love compels him to do so. Are y'all with me? And I know the way I set that up, I tricked you. But I got to tell you, this changes everything. Particularly in the reason why we devote ourselves. The reason we devote ourselves to the Lord God as believers, the reason we devote ourselves is because Christ's love compels us. It is the love of Christ poured into us that causes us to be devoted to knowing him more. I tell you, today's church has been misguided for quite some time. We have preached and taught and even believed that church is about you coming and getting what you need. But can I say it simply? If you have Jesus, you have everything you need. You have what you're hungry for. 
The big difference between the church in Acts 2 and the church today is that the church in Acts 2 realized when they received Jesus, they received everything they needed. Their hunger for this world died. The reason the church today struggles is because it still seeks, what can you do for me instead of what can I do for you? Motivated by hunger instead of being motivated by the love of God. So can I just say it? If you have Jesus Christ, you have everything you need, and our combined devotion is not out of need, but out of love for the Lord. And here's why I'm saying that. Person after person, Christian after Christian. Yeah, I'm not gonna go to that church anymore. I'm just not getting fed. I'm just not getting what I need. Do you see the problem? It's a heart that says the reason I'm here is so that you can give me what I need. Y'all, I can't do that for you. Jesus can, and if he's in your soul, he already has. And it's a matter of walking in that. Now, Whenever he comes into our hearts, does that mean that everything is fixed in us? Well, no, we still struggle with sin. So what do we do? Out of love for him, we devote ourselves. We devote ourselves to, to those pipelines. We devote ourselves to the word of God. We devote ourselves to the fellowship and, and, and encouraging one another. We devote ourselves uh, 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 to activating the spiritual truths in our lives. We devote ourselves to prayer. We devote ourselves to knowing the Lord God is because he he is what satisfies us. Why do we do it? Because we love him. It's not God, what can you do for me? By the way, there's a church down in Houston that's really good at talking about God just wants to give you everything you want. And it's not true. God has already given us everything we need and that is himself. Okay. Are y'all with me? Okay. Okay. Now, when the love of God is the inflow and the pipelines are open, there's a point at which there becomes an overflow. And when there's an overflow of the presence of the Lord, my goodness, watch out. And that's the next sentence. It says this, everyone was filled. When there, there's an inflow and when that inflow turns into an overflow, Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. By the way, uh, have you ever seen that happen? And I'm not talking about the fake stuff on TV. I'm talking about a real movement of God. Have you seen a movement of God where stuff happens that you just can't explain? We used to call it an awakening if you've been around a while, we used to call it a revival. And I tell you, until you've seen it and experienced it, it's hard to understand. But once you have seen it, you desire it. Have you seen a revival? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? You just can't explain it. But how do you get there? I wanna tell you a revival isn't scheduled and I'm not saying scheduling a time to pursue the Lord is a bad idea, but what I'm telling you is, a, you know, having a revival is not something that you necessarily put on the schedule. You don't schedule a movement of God, right? But let's remember back and analyze for a second. Perhaps the reason we used to have rev revivals for so many years was because we were tri trying to create inflow. Maybe that's what we were up to. Once a year, we would try and create inflow. And if we could get enough inflow, we would get enough overflow. And if we got an overflow, then we would be able to look back and say, my goodness, we've witnessed a revival. I mean, look at what we used to do. We would devote ourselves for sometime months ahead of time and we would start praying for revival. Why did Billy Graham always have great revivals? They started praying months in advance. They were devoted in prayer.
And then whenever the day came, whenever we would have our revivals, we would, pro- we would provide those four pipelines. We would pray for hours ahead of time. We would join together in prayer. Then in services every night, we would put our faith into action. And when we actually did it, when we actually dedicated ourselves for some time to pursue the Lord, the Spirit of God would move in our souls and we would have overflow. And when the overflow began to take hold, we would see what would happen. People would get saved left and right. Miracles would happen that would reveal that everything wasn't a coincidence. Lives would be changed. Stuff would happen that you couldn't explain. And the presence of God and the power of God would move among us. And we called it revival. Now here's my question. By the way, as I'm talking about it, have you ever seen it? I'm I'm looking for hands. Okay, you've seen it. Many of you have seen it. Here's my question. Was it real? Yes. Yes, it was. If you've seen the power of God move, and I asked the question, was it real? And the answer is yes, yes. And if you ever experienced it, you knew it was real. I want to tell you that's what happened in verse 43. You don't have to schedule a revival. Revival happens when those who have been filled with the love and presence of God come together and devote themselves in love of God to pursue him with all of their hearts. And when they do, the inflow gets so huge, it starts to overflow. And when it overflows, you know it because the presence of God starts to move. And you can feel it and you can see it. And I'm not sure how to describe it, but it fills you with an awe. And things start to happen. They can only be explained by the fact that there is a God and that he's here. And that is when real and authentic worship happens. Do you see? Real and authentic worship isn't something you come and do. Real and authentic worship is our response to a God who is moving amongst us and we can't help but say, wow, that's worship. It's an overflow of the inflow. Now here's an important question. Can you experience an inflow and an overflow of God in your life by yourself? There's a great question. And I would say to you, yes, I think you can. But I got to tell you, when we come together as a church and devote ourselves together, one plus one equals five. You can experience the movement of God in your life, absolutely. But if you want to see a real revival, it takes us. It takes all of us together. That's the synergy. One plus one equals five. When you have 50 people who are devoting themselves together in Christ, the synergy grows at an even greater rate. And 50 plus 50 equals a thousand I wonder what happens when 3,000 people experience an incredible movement of God. What happens when 3,000 people experience a revival and movement of God? What happens? It changes the world. That's how powerful it is. These 3,000, they experienced a movement of God that was just massive. And what happened? Man, it changed who they were. And as a result of changing who they were, man, it changed what they did. And as a result of that, it ended up changing the world. What happens when revival shows up in a people? Man, it changes everything. So what does God want you to do for your church? I would say to you, join together with other believers to love the Lord your God with an intense effort, with an obstinate persistence. And together, let us open the pipelines through the word, through the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and through prayer, so that the inflow of the love of God is turned all the way up. That's what we do. That's what you can do for your church. 
And when that inflow fills up to overflow, we worship and praise him in the overflow. And when that happens, it produces an outflow of God's love. The rest of this is the outflow. It's the result of an inflow that overflows. And here's what it looks like. It says this, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What happens? That's what happens. The outflow is something beautiful. And can't really be summed up. But let me just point out four indicators that that outflow is happening. When a church devotes itself and the inflow produces an overflow, it results in an authentic community. It says it this way, all the believers were together and had everything in common. That's an authentic community. This is oneness in Christ. We humans, we tend to congregate into groups. Have you noticed this? I mean, we all congregate into groups. Right now on college campuses, the students are so hungry to belong that they will congregate on issues that they know nothing about. Why? Because we have this tendency to congregate. We congregate in our politics. We talked about this several weeks ago, but we congregate with our social media as well. We tend to look for those groups of people that we can identify with so that we can go congregate with them. So all humans tend to congregate. That's not the question. The question is, what is our shared focus? Why do we congregate? What is our reason? What is our inspiration? And I want to tell you, if the reason is evil, if the inspiration is evil, the result will be evil. If the reason is economic, if the inspiration is economic, the results will be economic in nature and greed will rule. But what about us? And I'm not trying to compare us with all the groups in the world. What I'm trying to say is all the groups that are congregating out there in the world, they're looking for something that will satisfy the group. Church, we have found what satisfies the group. And it's Jesus Christ. And so when you have a group of people that shares a oneness in Christ, what is the result? The kingdom of God. Authentic community. When we pursue the Lord God and he is our reason, then we find a unity that we never had before. We find kingdom of God. That's what the church is meant to be. That's why we're here. It's a oneness and shared life that cannot be manufactured by man. It can only be received through the overflow of Christ in our hearts. And so when a church devotes itself and the inflow produces an overflow, it results in a life-giving oneness in Christ, authentic community. Not only that, but it produces a God-given generosity. Here's what it says, selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. I was talking to my dad last night at dinner and uh, he said, were you preaching on Sunday? And I said, I'm preaching on Acts 2, you know, 42 to 47. He says, were you gonna tell them to go sell all their stuff and give it to the church? said, no, dad, I'm not going to do that. But what is this about? It's about this, man. They, they, had, they had generous hearts. These people gave to one another. What happens when there, is a, when there is the inflow of Jesus Christ in this place to the degree that it produces an overflow? And out of that overflow, what ends up happening? Well, we end up having a, 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 a people, a group, a church that is, ha, has a God-given generosity, has a heart of generosity. And I tell you, when God's love overflows, generos generosity in the heart goes through the roof. The needs of the church are taken care of so that everyone has what they need. You see, it isn't about, okay, you come to church, give. It's about having a heart of generosity and following the Lord in that. And I got to tell you, we've got a very generous church right now. 
our youth are raising money to go to camp. And y'all might not know this or not, but right out here uh, in the connection area, there's a table and it's got envelopes on it. And uh, uh, they're looking for people to help fill the envelopes with a certain amount of money. They went one to a hundred. So if you grab the hundred, you give a hundred dollars. If you grab the one, you give one dollar. So, so they're looking for people to help fill the envelopes. You may not have known that. And you know what? I know that they're going to get every envelope filled. You want to know why? Because we're generous. That's what we do. Because of God's love in us, we have become generous. And the reason we're generous is because God is good. I tell you, when the church is operating, operating out of overflow, there is an incredible generosity in his people. Not only that, the people share life together. It says this, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. So they met, y'all, they had church every day. Oh my goodness. How did they work? They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. I tell you what, we could meet together every day if it were our greatest priority. Because you ain't working for 18 hours a day. If you are, you need to take a break. But we could. And that's what was going on with them. They could, so they did. Not only that, it says this, they broke bread in their homes together. And this is, this is debatable, but here's what I think that means. It's hard for them to, to, for them to use the phrase, broke bread together, broke bread. For them to use that phrase and it not have to do with the Lord's Supper, it would be odd. And so what were they doing? Not only were they meeting together in the temple courts, they were meeting together in smaller groups in their homes and with their families. And, and what were they doing? They were bringing Jesus into their smaller groups as well. And I'm not talking about Sunday school and I'm not talking about small groups. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who had a heart that said, not only do I love the Lord, but I wanna hang out with people who love the Lord too. That's what was going on. They shared meals together. They enjoyed Jesus and enjoyed each day. Day after day, they became the family in the Lord. When God overflows in his people, the outflow is not only sharing life together, but not only that, the church grew rapidly. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's, it's a bit of a miracle. But people got saved every day. If you continue reading through Acts, hundreds and thousands at a time, people are getting saved all the way through. The church is just growing rapidly. And what is it that causes that? Is it the love of God in Christ? Yes. But it is the love of God in Christ filling his people. And when his love fills his people, they start doing things that the world is looking for. Y'all, we have the answer. And when we pursue the Lord in that manner, that inflow, when we open up the pipelines, that inflow creates, creates an overflow. And that overflow has an outflow. And when that outflow happens, the Lord adds to their number daily those who are being saved. So, what does God want you to do for your church family? Man, he wants us to be a family. Not a group of individuals that come together to get what they want. But children of God who come together to celebrate the love of God. Engage together, open pipelines together through the word and the fellowship and enacting his will in our lives and prayer. Open the valve and let the inflow of the presence of God and the love of God flood our hearts. And I tell you, if we devote ourselves to this, it won't be long before there's an overflow of God's love here that we call revival. 
And it is from that revival that we share Jesus with one another. Our hearts overflow with generosity. Not only do we share church together, we share life together. And the Lord adds to our number daily those who are being saved. What does God want you to do? He wants you to join in that. To participate and to bring about the kingdom of God. That's what I'm praying for. Have you ever seen it? Man, it's good. And we can sustain it. How? Because Christ's love compels us to do so. You see, the thing that keeps you from walking in that is the idea that church is about me coming and getting what I want. What motivates you? I gotta tell you, it's found in this. It is found in coming here, not because God gives me what I want, but because Jesus has given me everything I need and I want to know him better. That's what church is about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, As we turn to you now, I ask that you speak to our hearts. Give us clarity. Help us to see. So that we might know you. And as you grow in our hearts and in our souls, that it changes not only who we are, but it changes what we do and how we live and everything about us. And so Lord, we want to follow you. So this morning, as we go into our time of commitment, that's, that's the question I would love for you to just spend some time talking to the Lord about. God, what do you want me to do for your church? If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, I wanna tell you, he is what you are looking for. He is what you hunger for. He is what you need. And he has made that first step of love that says, hey, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna die on a cross to pay the penalty of your sin. And as he was buried and resurrected on the third day, he, he then provides life for you and so, if you've never trusted in Christ here in just a moment, we're all gonna stand and we're gonna begin to sing. And if, and if you know you need him, Pastor David's gonna be down here, I'm gonna be down here. Just, just come down, grab a hand and say, I need Jesus in my life. We'd love to pray with you and help you. If the Lord's leading you to be a part of the family here at Acton Baptist, you come as well. If you'd like to just come and pray, come and pray. If you wanna come pray for the church, come pray for the church. but let's pursue the Lord. Let's have a devotion for the Lord, obstinate, persistent. Heavenly Father, we love you. We follow you now. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Would y'all stand please? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. If you have a decision to make, you come right now as we sing. The wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears Just did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone, I've been set free, 
My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised Let's celebrate that victory. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Heavenly Father, we do love you. We do trust you. We do need you. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would walk in celebration of what you have already done. My chains are gone. I've been set free. So, Lord, may we walk in your freedom, in your grace, and in your truth. And Lord, I pray for your church here at Acton Baptist, that we would be the church that you want us to be, the, the ones that you have called us to be. So may your truth move in us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you use that mic real quick? David's got an announcement. Hey, good morning. Just want to remind you all about the Thursday this week is the National Day of Prayer. And it's in our bulletin to remind you to come and pray from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock at the 1894 building. Or if you'd like to pray with as a group, we're going to meet here at noon to pray for about an hour on the emphasis of the National Day of Prayer, lift up the word, lift, light up the world. So look forward to seeing y'all Thursday. Thank you. Amen. All right. Thursday, National Day of Prayer. Uh, also, we do have a CMU tonight, so that's, we, that didn't make it into our announcements. So make sure you're here for that. And if you're a guest with us and you and I haven't met, please come see me. I'm going to be out the back doors and to the right. God bless you all. We will see you next time. <laughs>